Is it possible that by treating AI like a human, we're actually going to get better results from it? Or are we just fooling ourselves into thinking that it understands us at a deeper level? So today we're exploring this concept in prompt engineering and you might be surprised what we find. So why would we treat large language models like ChatGPT, Perplexity, Microsoft Copilot like human collaborators when performing these prompts? Well, it's only a machine, right? Let's consider two prompts from two different people about the same subject. So firstly, we have David's prompt where he types in, list a beginner at home workout plan with exercises, repetitions and frequency, focusing on body weight exercises. Okay, so the output that this large language model gives happens to look like this. As you can see, it's just a set of answers. Uh, beginner workout plan, squats three sets of 10 reps, push-ups three sets of eight reps. So what it's actually produced is a list of things. So is this an adequate response? Yeah, some people might say it is, but let's have a look at why this example might fall short. When you look at the language and the way it's expressed, it does lack that personal touch. Uh, the response is fairly instructional, okay, without any encouragement or acknowledgement of a user's beginner status, okay. There's minimal engagement, the output is a straightforward list, functional but lacking in conversation elements, and there's no extra tips. So it is answering the question, but it's very functional. So if you think about it, if someone came up to you in the street or at work and asked you a particular question in this way, um, very, very uh, rigid and, and functional, you probably wouldn't be motivated to give an expanded answer. You'd probably give a mirroring type of result uh, where you're just giving them the minimum requirement for the actual um, question itself. So let's have a look at another prompt by Samantha who types in, hi there, I'm new to working out and want to start a fitness routine but I'm not sure where to begin. I'm looking for something simple that I can do at home. Any tips or ideas? So the output that this large language model gives is, as you can see, a lot more expanded. It's um, a little bit more human, if you like. You know, Absolutely, starting out can feel overwhelming, but it's great that you wanna begin. Um, so it's using a lot of uh, nuanced phrases um, from, from language, human language, um, and it's actually going the extra mile to give extra tips. So you can see it's saying things like, oh, and don't forget to warm up with some light stretching and pr to prevent injuries. Um, and the key is consistency. So try to set aside three or four days a week to get started and things like that. So as you can see, this example works because it's encouraging and personalized, okay? So this large language model acknowledges the user's beginner status and provides simple, actionable advice, uh, which is actually welcoming and motivational. Uh, the engagement tone is friendly and supportive, um, making the response feel that it's coming from a personal coach, understanding that they're a beginner and it's giving actionable suggestions um, where the large language model um, is giving clear and easy to follow steps, making it less daunting um, for someone new to fitness. So the difference, using conversational human-like prompts uh, like Samantha's prompt creates more inviting and motivational uh, responses, especially um, important for users who may be nervous or starting something new. Uh, the rigid first prompt while precise, misses out on adding the extra layer of encouragement that can make the difference between just providing information and truly engaging with the user. So why does the large language model give a better response when talking to it like a human? The answer is actually twofold. So let's expand on the first point where this is called contextual mimicry, okay? Um, so how can large language models mimic or seem to mimic human behavior? Well, they're trained on vast amounts of data, okay, which comes from books, articles, social media, and human conversations. So this exposure itself helps them learn the nuances of the human language, um, tone and style of conversations, 
expression and context as well. So when a user talks to an LLM in a conversational style, the model recognizes this and will mimic the style in response. So as a form of response matching, the large language model learns that when a question is open-ended or friendly even, typical responses or typical human responses are also detailed and nuanced. So on the flip side, when input is minimal and rigid, expected responses are generally similarly terse and formulaic or cold, if you like. So the large language model amazingly mirrors this communication style it has observed during training. In essence, the model doesn't understand or intentionally match the user's tone in a human sense, but they are statistically trained to recognize um, these patterns in the communication. The model does expect that if a user communicates in a detailed and human-like manner, a similar response is appropriate. So that contextual mimicry we just talked about actually relies on the second main point, which is the shift in the user's mindset. So treating the large language models like humans during interactions taps into several key psychological and cognitive principles. So here's the science behind why this approach can be beneficial overall. Firstly, social cognition and the human mindset. So humans are naturally wired for social interaction. Uh, we have this ability to process social cues, adapt our communication style, and um, engage in dialogue, helping us make sense of the world around us. So when we interact with a large language model like ChatGPT, as if it were a human, this activates this social cognition in our brains. So what I mean by that is that it activates the neural pathways related to social cognition. Um, the same ones used when interacting with people, encouraging us to adopt a more collaborative mindset um, and making us more likely to engage in a deeper uh, back and forth type conversation, if you know what I mean. So when we perceive the interaction as a social exchange, we tend to stay more engaged, okay? So research in human-computer interaction shows that users are more likely to invest their time and effort into refining their questions and queries when they feel like they're interacting with an intelligent entity rather than just inputting commands into a machine. Secondly, a psychological phenomenon called the Proteus effect um, comes into play where users' behavior conforms to their expectations of the entity they're interacting with. So what I mean by this is if users treat the large language model like a human collaborator, they unconsciously adjust their communication style, okay? Using more nuanced, clear, and context-rich language. Um, so this effect can lead to improved prompt quality, like as we saw with Samantha's prompt before. Here, users provide more detailed conversational prompts as they expect the human-like entity to respond in a meaningful way, okay? So this actually results in better, more contextual appropriate outputs uh, because the model has more information to work with. So users are more likely to engage this iterative back and forth dialogue refining their prompts or starting from high level detail and then sort of breaking it down into chunks or lower level, more detailed questions um, as with what they do with a human partner when they're discussing something they're learning about. This actually helps in narrowing down more precise or creative outputs, enhancing overall quality of the interaction between the user and the model. It also promotes critical thinking in the human as users are more likely to evaluate and build on the large language model's output rather than taking anything at face value. So another reason is the priming and framing effects. So firstly, the priming effect is a psychological phenomena where um, exposure to one idea or concept influences how you think or behave in subsequent situations. 
it subsequently sets the stage for your brain to process information in a certain way. So a real life example here would be, so imagine you're reading a story about a marathon runner before going for a walk. So based on this, you might find yourself walking faster as if the idea of running has primed you for, to be more active. So how this applies to large language models is that when you approach a large language model with the mindset that you were conversing with a human, this primes you to naturally use more fluid conversational language and to provide richer content. You're essentially gearing your brain towards having a dialogue rather than issuing a command. So this mindset shift influences how you phrase your prompts making them more nuanced and open-ended. Um, and as we've seen, this can lead to more detailed or creative responses from the large language model. Also the framing effect. Well, framing refers to the way information is presented, okay? Um, which can significantly affect our perceptions, decisions, and interactions. An example um, that you might relate to here is considering a menu in a restaurant that describes a dish as succulent grilled chicken with a hint of smoky flavor. So this framing makes the dish sound more appealing, doesn't it? Than simply listing it as grilled chicken. The way it's framed changes your expectation and experience. So how this applies to large language models. When you frame the interaction with a large language model as a conversation with a human-like entity, you set an expectation for a more collaborative, iterative process in your mind. So instead of treating it like a search engine or Google, you approach it like a partner in dialogue, okay? So this framing changes how you interact so here you're more likely to give detailed explanations, ask follow-up questions and iterate and refine your prompts based on the responses you get. So this helps you engage in a deeper, more dynamic exchange, which often results in better and more tailored outputs by the model. And then there's cognitive load reduction. So as the name suggests, um, it's when we make the task easier for the brain by reducing the mental effort needed to produce the task. So let me paint the example with um, Siri and Alexa, uh, the voice assistants that many of us use. So if you had to give commands to Alexa and Siri in a precise structured format every time, such as set an alarm for 6.30 a.m. with a reminder titled workout categorized under morning tasks with volume level set to medium, that requires a lot of mental effort, doesn't it? You need to carefully structure your request, remember the exact syntax and consider the specific keywords that the system might pick up. Instead, you naturally say something like, hey Siri, set an alarm for 6.30 a.m. for my morning workout. In this case, as we know, treating Siri as if it were human uh, helps reduce your cognitive load because you're using everyday language, aren't you? The conversational language rather than thinking like a programmer or a computer operator. So here you can focus on what you want rather than how you need to say it, making that interaction smoother and faster. So applying this to large language models, when chatting to a large language model like a human, if you speak naturally, um, this reduces that mental effort needed to craft precise machine-like queries. So ultimately, you can then focus on the content and context of the query and get better results. Then there's the ELISA effect and suspension of disbelief. So let's use an example of chatbots in customer service. So imagine you're chatting with a customer service bot on a retail website because you need help with a delayed order or something. So the bot introduces itself with a friendly greeting usually like, hi there, I'm John, your customer support assistant. How can I help you today? So then you start explaining your problem as if you're speaking to a real person saying things like, hey John, my package hasn't arrived yet. Can you check where it is for me? So. Even though you know it's an automated system, you start using polite language, don't you? Explaining your situation in detail and even expressing emotions like frustration or gratitude, um, almost as if you're talking to a human customer service rep. 
So you, you might say things like, hey, John, I really appreciate your help. So this is the ELISA effect in action. So why it's called this is that it was named after one of the first chatbots, ELISA, where this effect describes how people tend to attribute human-like qualities, understanding and empathy to computers or AI systems, even though they know they're not human. In the background, the chatbot is simply following its programmed responses, but your brain as human interprets its friendly language and helpful behavior as signs of real understanding and empathy. The other one I mentioned was suspension of disbelief. So what this means is that despite knowing logically that John is just a chatbot, you temporarily set aside this fact to engage more naturally. So you treat John as if it has some level of awareness or intention. Um, making the conversation feel more genuine and human-like. So this helps you feel more comfortable and satisfied with the interaction, even though you know the chatbot isn't capable of that real understanding. So why this happens is that humans are hardwired to seek emotional connections, even in digital interactions. When the chatbot mimics that human-like language and responds in this way, we instinctively respond as if we're talking to a real person. So by doing this, you make the interaction simpler and more intuitive for yourself, reducing that friction and enhancing the overall user experience. So the main takeaway from this is that whilst the large language model doesn't understand or benefit from being treated as a human, the user does, okay? So I'm interested in finding out how you interact with chat GPT or perplexity or whatever large language model you use. Um, put your comments in the comments area below on this YouTube video and uh, let's get the discussion going. So if you liked this video, uh, you learned something from it, please subscribe to my channel, Digital Skills with Andrew. Share with people you might think will benefit from the content. And until next time, stay informed.